every time we schedule an interview with somebody from Italy, I want to move there. Yeah, me too. You know, Rod, we could do our podcast from there. I suppose we kind of could do it there, but you know what? You'd have to tear me away from my favorite food of all times, which is Italian food. Well, you don't have to worry about it tonight because I am making spaghetti. Of course, it's American style, but certainly not what you get in Italy, but really good. Well, you know what? I really love your spaghetti. I think it's absolutely wonderful and I actually can't wait for dinner tonight. But you know what else I like? I like your margarita pizzas. Oh, good grief. This gone with the show. I'm getting hungry. No, all I want to do is talk about food. Hi, everyone, and here we are celebrating what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Ingie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Row Show. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and you can check us out at thoughtrowpodcast.com, where you can also listen to episodes on our website and take a look at the show guest tab and see the actual person that we're interviewing. Yeah, that's kind of a cool feature we added. And yes, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Don't be shy. You can always reach us through the website's contact page and let us know your thoughts. It's pretty easy to do, actually. It's super easy. And all you have to do is type in your message and your email and it comes directly to us. You don't have to do anything fancy. And we do everything we can to answer them. Yes, we do. And then that is why our show is called Thought Row Podcast, because we want to hear your thoughts. Speaking of thoughts... As mm-hmm. we always do about this time in our show. Yes. How about your thoughtful quote? And you know what? I think you have two today. I do because I couldn't decide on either one. So I figured I would just read both of them because they were really nice. So the first quote is, you may have the universe if I may have Italy. And that is by Giuseppe Verde. Wonderful. And the second quote is the creator made Italy by designs from Michelangelo. And this is by Mark Twain. Wow. You know, I I don't know that I would necessarily think that Mark Twain would come up with that. I have a ton of respect for him, a respect for him, but I know he's traveled extensively. He traveled in Italy quite a bit. And I think he brought back his thoughts and ideas and they ended up in some of his books when he got back to Where? Hannibal, Missouri. Yeah, Hannibal, Missouri. It seems like a long way from Italy, but he was very uh, curious man and liked adventure and liked life. And equating that, his writing style with Michelangelo, I think that's very special. You know, the guy is brilliant and very attuned to life and people. So I I think that's an excellent quote. Yeah. And your Giuseppe Verde quote, that's pretty special, too. Yeah, I thought that was really nice, too. Well, that's his hometown. I mean, his home country, yes, right? Yes, it's a homeland. So, yeah. But now it's your turn, Rod. So we are ready for Rod's motivational moment. Might be a little anticlimactic after those two <laughs> no, great no, quotes. No. Okay, so here it is. Your life's attitude is nurtured by your daily gratitude. I'm going to so say that true. again. Your life's attitude is nurtured by your daily gratitude gratitude. You know, that is the true statement of all, I think. And it's sometimes it's hard because you don't, you don't feel like you want to be gratitude at all. Well, you know, when I was trying to come up with one and I was had my pencil and paper and I was kind of fooling yeah. around with this and I, I started to actually think about my attitude. Yeah. And then I also thought that I have an awful lot to be grateful for. And then I kind of realized that if you're very grateful for the good things that you have in life, and we all have at least one thing, that it uh, really improves our attitude. It does. It really does. And then also, if you're just tuned into the gratitude of even if it's small things, you can't find anything really fantastic to talk about that day because maybe you're having a bad day. But really, you can do little things like, oh, I have my favorite gum I can chew, or I have my favorite drink, I have my favorite cup. I mean, it can be very small things. And then pretty soon you can build into the bigger amounts of gratitude, like I'm healthy, I have a happy family, or I have, you know, a great car. You can fill in the blank with anything. You know what? Those are all uh, very valuable points. And I think about one time I was on an elevator in New York, And there was a guy on there who was, I guess he was kind of a comedian, 
But by the time we all got off the elevator, we all, I think people actually stayed on that elevator because they wanted (laughs) to, to they wanted to ride with him (laughs) all the way to the top or wherever he was headed. And he said a lot of really funny, loving things. And everybody that walked off that elevator car had a big smile on their face. And I suspect they probably took that into their offices. And I think they were grateful, right? The word Mm -hmm. gratitude. I think they were very grateful that they had the opportunity to ride that elevator to work with a guy who had such a great attitude. Gosh, what a talent to get on on an elevator and completely change everybody's life. Well, I think, you know, both you and I have had those experiences. And so. um, So neat. Yeah, it really does. It makes a big difference. So show gratitude. It'll really improve your attitude. So true. I like this discussion, but I'm going to change the subject slightly when it comes to creativity and your attitude. You know, that's that's really kind of important because Mm -hmm. our show is about creativity. Right. And your attitude, good or bad, definitely has an impact on your productivity and your creativity. Do you think? So true. If you if you go in with a bad attitude, I don't think you're going to get too darn inspired because you're not tuned in to anything. You're tuned in to all the negativity. Well, if you're sitting in front of your piano and you're trying to compose mm-hmm. or even just playing your favorite song to maybe make you feel better, maybe even to change your attitude. Right. Uh, but you got a really bad attitude. You're mad at the world or whatever the case may be. It's very difficult to be uh, creative. Now, I know there's people that will argue that some great art comes from people that have a really, really bad attitude. And there certainly is poetry Mm -hmm. that has come out of people that had a very bad attitude. But give me an example of somebody who you think Hmm. uh, as an artist had a bad attitude, but turned out really great works of art. Um, Let's see. Well, Sylvia Plath was not the happiest person on the planet. That's a great example. Maybe Bacon. Francis Bacon, yeah. for sure. Those are the only two I can think of right off the top of my head. How about you? What do you think? Well, that's why I asked you the question. Because you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> because I figured you'd come up you with somebody know. and I wouldn't know Way anybody. To go. Okay. I think your I think your Sylvia Plath was really quite good because every time I read her read her poems her poetry yeah um uh, you know you kind of want to slit your wrists i know that's a little harsh but man it's some that's tough a little stuff harsh but you know she was a very emotional person and and you know had a lot to say well there's people that really enjoy her work i don't know that i i was some composers i you know there is a composer i could say they had a, that I, I can think of that had a really bad attitude mm. uh, more often than Who's not that? and he had a strong justification for it, it was beethoven Oh, yeah. Right? Losing his hearing. That is the most saddest thing I've ever heard. And everybody thought that he was a grouch because they'd say something to him and he would just like walk off. He wouldn't engage. They all thought he was a jerk. You know, in modern times, they think that he might have had some kind of not Asperger's, but something along those lines where, you know, he, he had. Some was, conflict. He was a genius, but I think that maybe he had a personality, you know, kind of disorder or something along the lines of Asperger. Well, it was difficult for him to be social. Yeah. And I also think that there's a classic example of what you equated attitude and gratitude with creativity. And he actually is a classic example. And I'm glad I thought of it yeah. because he really, he had every reason to be unhappy and you can imagine what he had gone through, you know, his brilliant career and he can't hear his own music anymore. That would give you a really bad attitude. True. But it didn't affect his creativity. At least I don't think it did. Yeah, no, he was, that was sent from heaven. Yeah, I think so I too. mean, really. You know, while we're on the subject mm-hmm. of a good attitude in life, although we weren't exactly talking about a great attitude, but we know somebody who has a great attitude in life. Yeah. Uh, Let's bring on our guest. Okay. So today we're going to be speaking with Giovanni Lazaro, who is a, he has a very special talent. He is a violin maker. And that, my friends, that is a very creative talent. Yes.
As many of our listeners know, we interview creative people that are passionate about what they do. Today, Inchi and I are happy to welcome Giovanni, the violin maker. Yes, and on the phone with him will be Linda Winter, who's an artist and the one who introduced us to Giovanni Lazaro. And also, Linda was on uh, a podcast that we had yes, she was. a few episodes back. So if you're listening to this, you may want to also listen to Linda. And Linda has been a driving force in setting up this call and will help with some translation with Giovanni because we are not very fluent in Italian. Uh, to say the least, we are <laughs> definitely not a fluent. In fact, we're not all that fluent in English I today. Know, some days. Yeah, yeah some days. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So are you guys there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're yes. here. We're here. Hello. 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 It's good to have you here with us today. Now, okay, before we start our interview, Giovanni, we always like to ask our guest, what did you have for breakfast? So what did you have for breakfast? I, I had eggs. The lovely Michael, who puts up with a lot from me, cooked me eggs. That was nice. Giovanni has a very Italian taste take on breakfast. <laughs> and what was it? Yeah. What did you have? Ah, yes. It's uh, a typical Italian breakfast this morning. And uh, milk and some bread and um, fruit. I love to eat fruit uh -huh. because uh, it's very typical, normal Italian coffee. <laughs> That's very different from the <laughs> American coffee. Oh, yeah, so for I, sure. Yeah, so for yeah. sure. Espresso is very... Because very different from the American coffee that they tasted many years ago. And um, this is a typical style to have this breakfast, very easy, very tasteful in the morning, and just to go out home because you have to go to work, you have your son, your, your child. So right. Yeah, right. Uh, and so, typical life. Well, so, you know what? It sounds, it sounds refreshing. It's sounds very refreshing, easy and refreshing. Healthy and give you a lot of energy. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Some energy to to enter in your world, no? Yeah. Right. To do your best. Because I learned from Japanese philosophy, I love them, uh, that every day, you know, you have to do your best, simply. Yeah, Absolutely. I know, I know Angie has this question for both of you, actually. Yeah. Well, let's start by asking you, where are you talking to us from right now? Okay. Where we are, we are in the outer room of Giovanni's workshop. There's an outer room where normally he has his assistant, and then you go into the music room which is wonderful. It has a cupboard that is full of the most beautiful violins. And then into his workshop, which in actual fact is very similar to a carpenter's workshop. There is a bench and there are carpenter's tools and there's a view out of the window um, onto the, the square where in a place called Piazzale Manzini, which is the little, uh, the little area of the Piazza Manzini, and Manzini was one of the great um, men of Italian history and helped to unify Italy. Oh, nice. That is wonderful. You know, there's an interesting story behind how you two met yeah. and Linda and how you introduced us to Giovanni, the violin maker. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, basically, I bought his house. <laughs> well, that'll work. Uh, wow, that yeah. works. <laughs> um, so, so it's wonderful. I, mean, I, I, I came to Italy on a teaching contract and then realised that actually Italy felt like home. I went to a place called Monsolucci on a hot... Went, it was actually in February, February, early March afternoon, looking for a gelato because I was very fed up. I uh, found the only estate agent that was open in Monsolucci and in it was Giovanni and Lara's house. And then we arranged to go up and look at it. And I opened, well, Giovanni opened the door, and there's three steps up to the door. And I looked at this, what appeared to be an immensely tall man with an awful lot of hair. Um, and we met, and we've been friends ever since. And um, oh, how nice. What's, what's not to want when you get a chance to buy a violin maker's house? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And then I remember you telling Angie and I, even on a past conversation we had prior to us even doing the podcast with you 
you mentioned Giovanni and the fact that you purchased that home and actually you've made drawings of it, which are really quite wonderful to look at. But Mm -hmm. that's, uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you for being on our podcast and thank you for introducing us to To Giovanni. Giovanni, What what are you going to say, Angie? Well, you know, this question is for Giovanni. Before we go into the craft and art of making string instruments, tell us a little bit about your early life growing up. Oh, it was... uh... My approaching the violin making field, it was absolutely, it was my father. Mm. That when I was young, just we were eating a lunch together with my mother, and they just simply asked me, Why don't you, don't you think about to become a violin maker? And honestly, I didn't know what, the term, what is violin maker? I didn't know. And I went, uh, my father, uh, that was a teacher, he just uh, told me, take a look on the, on the dictionary. What does it mean? And so I went to his studio and I opened the dictionary and I searched for a violin making. It was a Lutaria. A Lutaria, we say in Italian. And uh, I found that he's who makes uh, violins, violas, and cellos. I didn't know. It was the first time in my life that I heard this term. And uh, I simply became curious. I say, oh, why not? And so we went to visit the violin making school in Cremona. It was uh, 80, 1980. And we went there with my mother, my father, and we went into this classroom where there were some uh, schoolboys that were carving, uh, working on the workbenches, doing some different works. Uh, and I was absolutely fascinated. And uh, I fallen in love suddenly when I turned my eyes in a, and I saw somebody that was carving a string things that uh, is a scroll, the scroll, the volume, volume of the cello. And uh, I immediately say, wow, this is incredible. Oh, and nice. I, yeah. I turn back my eyes to my mother and I say, mama, I will do it. And this is simply the, the true history. And then the, since that time, I'm working on pieces of wood and making scrolls. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you know, that's really uh, an interesting story. And you obviously were meant to yeah, do to this do for this, a living. Right. And I think it's kind of a blessing that your father made that suggestion to you because it gave you an opportunity to develop a passion for something. Mm-hmm. My, I also have a question about that, because I know you've developed a passion uh, for music. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, okay. Uh, to develop a passion for something, it always comes from people that you have around you, or from somebody that gives you the right uh, suggest input, we can say, no? I was simply falling in love since I was young because my father was a lover of music, because mm-hmm. my mother was a lover too. In my family, there was a pianoforte that I, now I have in front of me. It's here with me since 40, 50 years of my life. And uh, I just uh, start playing piano. I am a player of piano. Okay, my heart is uh, for Rachmaninoff, uh, Chopin, uh, but uh, music is in my blood. And when you have something in your blood, something happens. Maybe you will become a painter, so I don't know. You will paint, uh, you will sculpture, you will do something. You just became a teacher of art, uh, or you will speak, uh, I don't know what, to somebody. But in this case, uh, the music is absolutely the base of everything. The oh, passion, yes. oh, yeah. love, music is my base, my background. And from there, maybe today I could be also a musician because I was studying in the Conservatory of Music in Padova and I was playing pianoforte and the flute. So often I think about it. What I could be today if I couldn't be a violin maker? What could be another chance of my life? Maybe to be a musician, for sure. So I'm lucky that my parents, 
they were a very smart teachers, uh, clever teachers, and uh, they had so great passion for culture. That's excellent. Means uh, culture. I, I learned that culture is absolutely necessary in your life. You need it because if you want to have a beautiful life full of uh, meaning, I can go to use the right word, but if you want to have a full life, you need to search for culture, for beauty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we, 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 we couldn't agree more yes. with you on that one. And that's such, uh, you stated that so beautifully. And uh, the fact that you have that passion for music, that's just an, another part of culture that you've been able to embrace. That's really quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Without music, I think that we can't live simply. No, I, I agree. I agree well, with that. it goes oh back. In fact, the earliest instrument from our understanding has been a flute. Flute, right. And so music has been in man's uh, blood. Ever since, since the maybe beginning, the beginning, the beginning of time. So, what is your question, Angie? Well, as a string instrument maker, Giovanni, what instruments do you actually make? Okay, I am uh, specialized in uh, violins, violas, and cellos. Of course, at the beginning, I worked on guitars and uh, mandolins. Step by step, I became more focused and specialized in this field. That is very. It's a very beautiful field, but very hard field. Um, okay. And now, violins, violas, and cellos is the main production, is my trade, my business, and this is my activity. Of course, I do many other things related to the string of instruments, uh, to, the, to my client's activity, of course. Right. I supply with many services, but... And my love is to restore and maybe when I have time to make my own instruments. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. You know, there are many t different types of string instruments and you just kind of went over your favorites. But could you give us a brief explanation of what each of your favorites actually do when it comes to a symphony? You have a, you have a lovely explanation in relation to voices. <laughs> Yes, okay. I love this stringed instrument and everybody have a, a quick uh, feeling with violins as well as with cellos and violins because they, they reflect the human voice. This is also the reasons why these instruments are being created at the beginning of 16th century in Italy just to reply uh, to sustain the voice, the choir. Okay. What uh, is incredibly beautiful about this instrument is that they give you a deep sensation, a deep feeling of uh, warmth, of beauty. And uh, they can move your heart. They immediately give you a, an embrace. It's like an embrace. And um, this is what I love about these instruments. Of course, I love any kind of instrument. Mm, okay? Sure. But the human voice that has the violin, as well as the tenor voice that has the cello, uh, they can give you an incredible, deeply sweet sensation. And any, any everybody, uh, all of us, we have different... Um, Taste that we have different ability in uh, have own uh, a, a nice feeling, a special feeling uh, with uh, this kind of sound, in spite of that kind of sound, for example. And uh, so the same sound give us uh, different opportunities. We can uh, receive this emotion and. Each one can uh, keep it uh, in different ways. And this is the beauty of the music, of course. I think that's a, a beautiful explanation. Yeah, it really was a beautiful uh, explanation. Yeah. Really. Yeah. This is the, the beauty of... And please let me know, uh, let me say, sorry, <laughs> that uh, no 
the, the live music is absolutely different from the recorded music. Ooh, in spite yes. of me, okay, the recorded music is an incredibly beautiful tool, we can say, to spray the music. But the live music is something I, I experienced that I would like to suggest to everybody. Goes to their concert in a live concert. L- listen the music live because it's absolutely different. Oh, that, it's I mean, completely oh, different. Yes. It's completely different. And we've had that experience ourselves. In fact, I think you, we all discussed that in a past conversation that what you hear on a lot of people listen to music on their cell phones. Right. And there's nothing like the acoustics. Yeah, nowadays, especially. It's, yeah. And nothing like the acoustics that you hear in a live performance. It's mm-hmm. just incredible. And you also, I think, pick up the energy from the musicians too. You actually see yep. them playing. They give off their own energy and you can see how passionate they are when they're actually participating in a piece. And if it's a concert, then you also have the conductor directing everybody. So it's just very exciting all the way around. And we agree with you. We, we highly recommend that anybody that has a chance to go to a concert, even if it's just a string quartet, it's well worth the Absolutely, it is. I remember us uh, going to a few string quartets when we were in Europe. And oh my goodness, the sweetness that you heard from the string quartet was does not even measure up to a recording. And Giovanni, you live that life. Yes, you do. You get to hear that for real all the time. Yeah. So very cool. Well, you know, it seems to me that making a string instrument is a craft that requires not only skill, but a tremendous amount of patience and dedication. Tell us how you approach your work every day. Okay, my, okay. First of all, I I think that I'm very lucky that I have a really incredible job, job of kids, a job. It's a a passion more than a job. It became Uh a job. We need money to live, but (laughs) okay. Uh, We need to eat bread. And to pay the billings to buy a car, but for me, I will do it without to get money. But we, we can. Okay, this is the, the normal life. I'm lucky that I have this job where every morning when I get up, I I think that I I will be lucky that I will meet somebody, some musician, some clients, friend, or. Somebody that will give me new emotions or will push me to do something beautiful, to express a new concept or to make a new piece uh, of of instruments or to get a new emotion. So this is why I'm lucky. And every day is a very also hard work. Of course, it's not easy. You know that. To get the best, you always have to invest a lot of energy. And this is not easy. It's hard. But when you step by step, every day, week and months and years, you build up. You become more comfortable with your work. You, you improve your skills. And you meet new people. You get new information. You beca- Everything helps you to enjoy and to enjoy life. That's all. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, an inspired life. I, I really liked what you said. Yeah, yeah it's very, very inspirational profound, what you said. Very profound. And I know you probably meet a lot of people that get excited just to, to visit your shop. <laughs> yeah, to see what goes on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have to ask you this question because we know there's a lot of commercially made instruments out there. The ones that are mass produced. And a handcrafted instrument such as the ones you skillfully make, what is the big difference there? Okay, believe me, it's not so hard. It's not so hard to make a violin. Everybody can make a violin with uh, some skills, uh, some uh, clever approach. Okay, so the difference, the main difference between a factory made instrument from the handmade instrument is that in the handmade instrument you have a chance to put uh, your own soul. Uh, It became uh, your instrument is your 
only your instrument. There's only one instrument like yours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a unique production. And your sound is your sound. With the factory instruments, uh, I have great respect because you know there are so many people that you want to learn to play violin, they can afford immediately uh, a huge, uh, a big expense. Okay. So they can introduce many people to the violin. But when you became uh, to play violin seriously, it's like uh, when you drive a car. At the beginning, you need um, uh, a good car, simple, cheap, not expensive, because you need to practice driving. But when you became, one day, for example, you are so good in driving, and you became a driver, professional drivers, a sport, you need a sport car, and you want to race with cars, you need a, a top race car. So uh, the handmade instrument is uh, like a top race car. It's like a Ferrari. Mm. It's like a Porsche. Yeah. It's a very expensive car where you need the skills to dominate the car. You know how to use it. And uh, the car is so powerful that you must know how to, to keep it in your hand. It's the same for violin. A really nice, great violin gives you a race car. I hope that this explanation is... Uh, yeah, it's perfect. It's that is wonderful. A, that's a, an analogy is excellent. I love it. And and I love having a race car in your hand because it really is like that. You get that same exhilaration and the same... And feedback. And the fr same freedom that you can feel by going very fast, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Giovanni, string instruments are primarily crafted out of wood. Is there a special source for the wood that you use in your finely crafted instruments that you make? Okay, um, the wood is the, the soul of the instrument. Mm -hmm. So you need the material, the raw material must be the best part. Of it. And I use um, wood, for example, the maple comes from the northern of Italy. And uh, because the, the quality of the Italian maple is uh, officially the best quality in the world. And it has some technical uh, features that are very, very important for the sound. The maple is mainly used for the back ribs and scrolls of the instrument. It's coming from Balkan area, Serbia, and Herzegovina, and ex-Yugoslavia. To, to, to. Mm -hmm. It's very, the quality of that maple is absolutely the best one. Okay, uh, we are speaking both for the beauty, aesthetical beauty, but the wood mainly is for the sound. And when you find the right, the right material, I stuck for many, many years. Now, for example, I'm making instruments uh, using wood that I bought with my father in 1994, 1993. Hmm. Oh, my goodness, a long time ago. My wood in, is in my stock. And when I buy today the wood, I will use in a cup at least uh, not before 10, 50, 20 years. Okay. And uh, if you want to make a great instrument, you can't use a cheap wood or bad wood. Okay. Coming back to the race car, if you have a top car, you will use a Goodyear Michelin. Sure. Sure. Tires. You will never use cheap tires okay <laughs> that would be dangerous the same thing you need the best absolutely the best material because with the best material with your experience and your skill tools you can understand how this material just touching just watching how it will sound and then you will create since the beginning your project is based of on the wood that you have on your hands. You say, okay, this is perfect for this kind of sound, and then I will use for this kind of sound. Or no, this is bad for the other kind of sound. This is a deeper sound. This will give a deeper sound, a more amber color sound. No, 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 this, is, this will give a silver quality sound. Then it will be right for another kind of instrument. And without this knowledge, 
you can consider yourself a volumaker. This is my point. You know, that is very interesting. And I don't think we ever really appreciate the wood, what it means to have the quality wood as well as the seasoned wood. Obviously, you season your wood, it, you keep it for a long time. So even the wood itself uh, matures in its resonance. But we know from earlier conversations with you that every string instrument that you make has its own unique characteristics and personality. Could you share with us what that means? <laughs> you can speak hours, but I will try to be, <laughs> to be brief, uh, to, to say, to explain quickly. Uh, it's so complex, um, but it, it, this is really the, the, the focus of So you have in front of you the a musician, and maybe for sure you will speak about the musician later, no? But you have in front of you a great player. This great player has his own taste. Where when you make an instrument, you have to match his taste. And in the meantime, to, to um, give an imprinting of your point of view. So the instrument became a perfect mix of uh, the request of the client and your taste. You mix together and then uh, you have to make something that give uh, the great support to this musician and reflect his quality of sound, his quality of playing. And this is the most beautiful uh, aspect of my work when I study and I speak with my client what we have to do, well, where we want to arrive, what should be the instrument in play, what sh- how should it play. And the so the, every instrument is like a person for me. Mm-hmm. I can see that, yeah. I believe that the, the instrument is like a person, like us. And he has his own uh, identity. He has his own uh, characteristics uh, and is a person. Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a really good explanation. That's a, it really is. That's a great is. explanation. And I, I understand from what you just said that you work very closely with the musician once you start crafting it. And you have to really understand and listen to his music, how he plays his style of playing. And then you have to design the instrument to fit not only, I guess you have to also make sure it fits him physically, that he can hold it properly. Yes, yes, you are right. You perfectly tell, you tell exactly. This is the, the real violin making. It is uh, working in tight contact with the, your, your friend, because you, you became friend with him. Oh, I'm when sure. You stay in touch for many years, you work on his funny, old funny instruments. And then he he make a commission to you for a new instrument. Uh, there, this is the moment where you put all yourself. He, he, he watch you and he asks you, please, Giovanni, make me an instrument. And when he say, make a mini and make uh, an instrument for me, you have a big, big challenge, a big responsibility because you have to give the right answer. And so this is why I love work. Yeah. Yeah. Because every day I put myself in a really bad situation that I have to do my best, simply. I can imagine. <laughs> yes, you do. I, uh, and you, what we could, I know you have a follow up to that that well, I just y- talked about. You guys, yeah, we just talked about that. And then also just listening to the sound of someone playing one of your instruments is simply beautiful. And I can tell you that when you, you and Linda had sent over a recording and we listened to it on our computer, even that, listening to it just on the speakers of the computer, it was so beautiful. And it must be so gratifying for you to hear someone play an instrument that you have designed and crafted. How do you feel when you hear a virtuoso playing one of your instruments? Good question. Hey, big question. Really beautiful question. Thank you for making Yeah. Simply... Um, Mm-hmm. You have uh, to consider that when you listen to your instrument playing a concert in the hands of a great player, or simply yeah. a child is in front of you in your studio, in your music room, playing on your instrument, you simply, um, the emotion is what you feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And uh, when I when I see an instrument that they made several years ago, and that they come back here for a check checkup, it's like to see a picture of me ten years ago, twenty years ago. I see myself mm -hmm. because I recognize my myself in this instrument. I say, oh, I was this one, and today I'm different, and. The emotion that they feel, I can't explain honestly. It's simply not. It's the the energy that keep me alive and that push me ahead in my work. Uh, I work for this to listen and a great musician play on my instruments. This mm -hmm. is my life. Wow. Well, you know, it must be very rewarding. For a talented musician to have the opportunity to play one of your instruments that you've handcrafted, or better yet, to own one, what are these musicians like that yeah, purchase I'd, I'd love to one know of what your instruments? Like. Yeah, who are they? Like, uh, I don't want to say who are they, but what are they like? And obviously, you've become lifelong friends with yeah. some of them, I suspect. Yes, we became friends. I have uh, different clients. Uh, you also, you know that I, I produce really few instruments every year. I produce two, three instruments every year, no more. I, I, okay, I, I made almost 190 instruments, but oh, it's oh. not a big production. For, uh, you became a friend because when you have uh, a great musician, they understand what you do yeah. and love what you do. And it's not necessary that, that everybody loves what you do. No. Uh, it happened that you meet the right person with you have the right feeling, and then you come you share the same point of view, the same taste, the same point of view, also the life. If you share uh, the same feeling for life, then you became friend. I have really great musicians that are my friend, and they became friend of with them simply because we met. And we felt very well together. And simply because they, they decide to order an instrument of mine, and simply because we share two, three years <laughs> following the birth of this new instrument for them. And it was a long process, and we shared the ideas about the call of the warning. I can imagine it must be very exciting for them as a musician to also witness the process. And I'm sure the day that they finally take possession of the instrument that you made, that probably is a very happy and uh, proud day for them. Mm -hmm. You know, as you're an artist, okay, for sure you're an artist, a craftsman. I think everybody would like to know how you sign your instrument. Mm -hmm. How do you sign one that you create? How, If I were to pick up one, how would I know it was crafted by you, Giovanni? Okay, um... Basically, every make violin makers, the tradition is to put inside the instrument a label. Where you, my label is Giovanni Lazzaro, Fece in Padova, and it means that uh, Giovanni Lazzaro made this the, the, this violin in uh, the year ninety ninety five, right? And then I add my signature, and especially. Uh, since uh, almost 20 years and more, every instrument has its own name. Mm -hmm. The name is uh, Caronte, is uh, Maddalena, is Caterina. We have the, uh, different kind of names that are being given to the instrument because the, the name of the instruments reflect the meaning of your friendship. With the client, oh, nice. or it can reflect something that match you and the client. For example, one of the last uh, violin that they made for one of my best friends and clients was named Katrina. Katerina it is a uh, beautiful name. It is beautiful. The daughter is named Katerina because she said, "I have security. This this friend had uh, really some troubles with this girl." You know, life is not easy for anybody mm -hmm. sometimes. And he was so worrying about his daughter and they did so many efforts and 
uh, he was lucky that everything was fine at the end. And so I suddenly, with the, together, we decided to name the violin Katerina. Oh, how nice. For me and for him, it's a really incredible oh, value. I, I'm sure it makes it very special for him. You know, I have to, or I want to ask this question. I don't want to get into a too deep of a discussion, but both Inji and I know that Laura, Laura, could you share a little bit about who she is and what her support has meant to you? Apparently, she's a very keen fan of yours. She's my lady. She's my love. Well, then and she's, she's really your super fan then. <laughs> she's uh, simply my, my love, my life. Yeah. She's uh, my mother of my of Eduardo, uh, that has, uh, is uh, three and a half years old now. And uh, she's uh, the, um, the girl that I met eight years ago. And uh, she was a violinist. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. It happens. it happens. You make friends, you make love. So there's somebody. Okay. And uh, she was the mind. She was uh, an incredible, and she's still my best partner because uh, always Lara, she gave me a point of view that is a really uh, an uh, external point of view. She look at me, she watch what I do, and uh, she always suggests me, no, 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 you are worrying. You are making a mistake. No, no, you are doing well. No, no, do that. Or no, we have to change. You have to. So I'm so lucky that she's so clever and she's smart to give me always his uh, deeply loved subject. Honest subject. And she doesn't save uh, to tell me, no, no, you're doing, why did you do it? You are wrong. You are doing well. You must do better. And this pushed me always to change, to renew, to have new energy to put inside. Uh, uh, she was an incredible tank of energy. I can imagine, you know, you and I have something in greatly something in common because Angie is the same way for me as uh, Laura is for you. I can't tell you how many times that she's redirected me or redirected my thinking or said, hey, you know what? You could do this a little bit differently and it probably would be better. So bravo, you know, to yeah. your to your bride. What a lovely lady. But that, I can understand where Laura is coming from though because when you care for someone and you understand them on multiple levels, their soul, their creativity, and what their passion in his life. You want you want to be contributing to that and you have a real connection. So I can completely understand where she's coming well, from. Well the fact that she played a violin. Right. Is, well but there, there's there, some there, there's some oh, understanding right, there. Absolutely. I, if I can I must tell you what happened. It was it's very simple and incredible for me too after many years. I was with, uh, okay, I had another life before, okay? I have another son that is 21 years old. He's studying at the university. Is uh, Lorenzo is my first son. Okay, I had another life. It happens, okay? And, um, but when I saw the first day, so a lot of went inside my atelier for work on his violin. I never met her before. And uh, I simply went in front of her and I was so astonished and amazed. I didn't believe it. I said, wow, who's that girl? Uh -huh. And uh, after three days, we fall in love. Ah, how beautiful. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going, to just, I'm going to bring an extra voice in here, being somebody who actually knows these two. Yeah. But to be with them, the atmosphere between the two of them is electric. Oh, I can imagine. Um, She's very young and she's remarkably strong. And Giovanni often describes her as his tiger. Huh. And, and she she has the strength of, of a tiger. And she's just a total driving force in his life and a very, very remarkable young woman. It sounds she like sounds it. Lovely. She sounds lovely. I'm going to ask you, Giovanni, a question that we ask everybody. It's sometimes it could be a tough one. 
but everybody wants to, an answer to this for sure. In five words or less, what would you tell people that want to live more creatively? And if you have to use more five words. It's okay. F- it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've kind of you kind of addressed it in a lot of the things that you said, but if you're going to give advice to maybe even a, a young violin maker, what would you tell them? Just to enjoy. First of all, to enjoy, to express, uh, to be ready to 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 be hard, to follow hard your your talent. If you have a talent, you you must exploit your talent. But talent is not enough, never. You must practice hard. You must work hard. And you need time. You need a lot of time. Because uh, today, I have the impression that many, many people think that to get the top is easy. You can arrive in, suddenly to the success. You get success really reach uh, very quickly. This is not true. In my experience, uh, uh, it's very hard uh, and uh, only few people can get it. And these need uh, talent, application, a lot of energies and a lot of mistakes too. Oh, sure. And, uh, some you you know. In some, I, I live to some moments in where I decide to live to be a violin maker. They say, okay, no more, stop. But you can and you must go ahead if you trust in yourself. See, that's that's like the perfect explanation of to enjoy your life and big success with what you're doing. So yeah, it, you can't, fabulous. You can't give up. You yeah. may feel days like you absolutely do not want to do it. Yes. But sooner or later, the the but then the next morning you get up and you're refreshed and you're like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. I like it. Yeah. Okay. So yes. now we're going to ask you, Giovanni, the question we've been asking all of our guests and, and their answers are so interesting. And that is if you can sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? <laughs> oh, so many, so many. <laughs> uh, first, <laughs> very, very hard. Um, David Ostrak, one of the greatest violins. Oh, yes. Yeah. I would like to sit with him and to speak with him, to say, please speak about me, about the soul of the violin. Or Van Gogh, or Pizarro. He's my painter, my love so much, Pizarro. Yeah, Pizarro, and, uh, for sure. Rakhmaninov, Rakhman, Rakhmaninov, simply because his music is so... When I met his music, uh, I, I say, okay, I can't live anymore without that money of music. And uh, to ask him, how can you be so genius? Please tell me. <laughs> That's a great That's a question. question. That's a, how can you be such a genius? If we, ever get, if we ever get Mozart as a guest, <laughs> we'll, ask him, we'll that. ask him that for you. <laughs> it's an incredible. His life, you see. He, 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 Very short. Yes, yeah, sure. 33, 34 years, I don't know. And if you consider Van Gogh, Van Gogh became a painter and he painted only for almost well, about 10 years, but it was already 28, almost 30 years when he became painters. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it was what I, I really would like to speak with him, to ask him, how did you see ahead? So how you are being able to see in front of you, 100 years in front of you, 200 years in front of you. And remember, Van Gogh never sold an in No, no. Even, Only one. Yeah, for, yeah, as hard as Leo uh, tried. He, he, You have to think that these great, talented people, especially the ones that passed away so young were divinely inspired Mm -hmm. yeah that was their mission on this planet i guess and that was it to bring joy joy beauty creativity inspiration yeah like your violins like your violins violins. too i hope i hope my violins will uh will pass me 
they will follow their own way and I will die because we, we die one day if we are lucky one day we will, for sure we will die but uh, I, I only think that something of me will remain in the future oh for sure oh, yes. absolutely it will uh, G- yeah, Giovanni and Linda, I hate to part on this this conversation because it's very, very interesting uh, on actually making a beautiful instrument that has been a major contributor to classical music as well as other forms of music. Both Inge and I, thank you so yeah. much for giving us and our listeners an opportunity to know a little bit about how it's done. You are so generous with your thoughts and your ideas and your passion. I think that really came through. Yes, it did. And your creativity and craftsmanship is such an inspiration. And I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this episode because so much insight and and into such a creative. interesting and creative passion. Passion and right. life. Yeah, and, a life. and also, I need to let everyone know, if you'd like to know more about Giovanni, we will have links for him under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about him and please connect with him on social media and his website. Yeah, please do. You, you, this is a real treat. We're very fortunate to have him as a guest. And Linda, we really appreciate you making this happen. I know we had talked about it off and on now for several months. So yes, uh, thank you so thank, much. Thank you guys so much. No, no, absolute uh, it was an absolute pleasure, and I'm lucky that I have Linda as my friend. <laughs> <without> <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. We can meet, maybe. So, <laughs> thank you to you. You are being so uh, so kind to dedicate your to pay your orientation to me, and uh, I have a, a big debt to to Linda for all these great chance. Oh well, we appreciate both of you very much. And so it's goodbye for now. Thank you. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day.